Welcome back to JADC2 and the Future Warfighter. I'm George Jackson, executive producer of GovExec TV. Let's continue today's conversation with Doug Jones, Senior Vice President and Defense Group Chief Technology Officer at Lidos. Doug, always great to see you, sir. Thanks for being here. Thanks, it's great to be back. So you heard this conversation with Colonel Brumsey, Colonel Spitaro. What stands out? I think there are two things. First is Colonel Spataro is really around interoperability 2.0. You know, as we look at how do we go beyond our sort of basic level interoperability and start having that evolutionary interoperability. Um, one of the challenges we've had is very much a standard-based approach to interoperability in the past, uh, and we're seeing struggles with that, and it can't keep up with the speed of change. And we look at interoperability 2.0, how do we have more interoperability, whether it's joint forces across the services or inside the services, but we need to pull all that together, but it also needs to evolve because the types of data we're gonna to need to make decisions may change over time, and we can't let that be driven by standards, which tend to move slow. So be able to keep up with the speed, I think that interoperability 2.0 and that evolutionary approach to that interoperability is absolutely critical. And then from Colonel Brumsey, I think another piece is how do the role of people in the military change? When you start looking at today, you have a lot of people and soldiers that are manually doing process activities to get data for commander to make a decision. In the future, we wanna to move to lots of machine to machine interactions and then have a commander in the loop where the commander's making the decision that's absolutely critical, that's life or death, or what we're gonna take action on. So they're still in the loop, but a lot of the other people are now out of the loop and we're moving the loop and we let them do other things, looking at trends, looking at issues, forecasting things, not doing a lot of the manual activities that's taking away from them being able to you know, really enable the commander from a warfighting perspective. My colleague Patrick gave a 40,000 foot view of JADC2 right at the top of the program. It's such a complicated area of study, but his synopsis was one of the best that I've ever heard. But he didn't really get into the key capabilities of JADC2. We've talked about this before, but I do think it bears repeating for this audience. What are some of the key capabilities of JADC2? Where does Lidos fit in there? So I think a key area Lidos fits in there is something we've been investing in called Edge to Cloud with a software capability called Sensor to Shooter. We saw the need that everyone wanted to move to the cloud, but there was no Oconus Cloud. We saw this year the DoD came out with an Oconus Cloud strategy. We saw that back in 2019, start investing it, and we've built an Edge to Cloud ecosystem where we take cloud agnostic capabilities, and we take things like containerization, and how do you do various comps across those things in a, in a secure, zero trust way, and we've actually built that ecosystem out to show how you can take the power of cloud capabilities and deploy it all the way into a backpack of a warfighter. And then everything from there to a Ford operating base, and, and then a regional base, and then back to the, the, the major clouds, the hyperscale clouds in a seamless way. And that's absolutely critical when you talk about getting that compute and processing power to the edge so we can take all those mass amounts of data and make decisions at speed. And then what we did is we said, well, okay, we created the infrastructure, but now we have to show how that actually implement impacts the warfighter. So we developed something called Sensor to Shooter. We spent a lot of time with F-8 hits, which is the primary, we, we're modernizing it, and we own the legacy for the Army's primary long-range position fire C2 system. And we said, okay, what do we know about that? And what do we know about the kill chain for a long range position fire? And we found that it was very suboptimized. A lot of phone calls, a lot of various data that was not shared between systems. We took all that together. We took the existing puzzle pieces, including a legacy system written in ADA, you know, a dead language out there with you know, millions of lines of code in that. And we wrapped it in a container and then we put in front of it microservices to do that interoperability translation that the kernels talked about that's a struggle and showed how we could shorten the kill chain from where they had today by an order of magnitude hmm. based upon optimizing those swivel chair phone calls that were happening, creating interfaces between systems that didn't exist to share that data, to really optimize that long range position fire use case. You mentioned trusted systems. There's a phrase that I'm coming across more and more in these types of conversations, network resiliency. How important is network resiliency as the Department of Defense looks to really build from the step one where they are right now in JADC2? I really think it's the foundation of everything we do. So if we want to be focused on information dominance, to be able to allow those decisions to be made, you have to have your network, because that's what the comms are about. And one of the things we're seeing is, in today's world, we're producing massive amounts of data. The network is your constraint. 
it's also the area that the adversary is gonna attack. Well, we've seen it today with all the cyber attacks. And when you start looking at how do I provide resiliency so I can make decisions, I need to have that network resiliency. And that resiliency comes in lots of flavors. It comes in just straight cyber. It comes in um, various alternative paths. So am I gonna use satellite comms? Am I gonna use fiber? Am I gonna use 5G? Um, and how do I do that securely? And then you look at how does it deal with things like jamming, electronic attack, and EW. So how do you build resiliency so that I can get information back to the commanders to make decision and get information from commanders and national assets like ISR to the warfighter to, to be able to make those informed decisions? We know we're going to end up fighting in islands, you know, in terms of islands of people because they're going to be blocked from comms at times. So get that commander's intent to them and feed them data intelligently through resilient comms that can weather a storm of both cyber electronic attack. We heard from Patrick and the Colonel some of the challenges that government faces right now around the implementation of JADC2. Give us an industry perspective. Same question. What are some of the challenges? Well, I think the challenges when you take a step back become multifold. We talked about earlier, we're trying to do joint with other countries. We're trying to do joint between services. And then in, we're trying to do multi-domain, so from space to undersea and everything in between. And we're trying to do things in services that are already siloed. The Intel apparatus doesn't really always communicate well to the COCOMs, doesn't always communicate well to like logistics and medical and support infrastructure. Those things have been developed oftentimes in silos inside of their functional parts of the services. So we have to break down all those silos. The other thing is, is we can't wait. We can't wait for five to 10 years to deliver the new capability. We have to go to evolutionary approach. One of the things I think we really need to focus on from an industry perspective is how do we deliver in a heterogeneous world, which drives open systems architecture so the interoperability isn't this painful construct that we have today with closed interfaces um, and these uh, you know, bespoke systems that are so unique they don't communicate well together. So that heterogeneous world is a challenge. And the other thing is, is delivering capabilities quickly. So we we need to evolve in a kill chain approach. Instead of a technology driven approach, how do we look at what is the goal? What is the mission goal we're trying to do? Whether that's how do we, you know, take out a mobile SAM launcher so that we can protect our airmen when they're flying a mission. So if we identify from when we identify where that is to the time we could take out that SAM launcher, and what's that timeline? How do we shorten that timeline? That timeline goes across like 15 to 20 different systems and a bunch of manual phone calls. So how do we go attack that timeline to get it so that we can get them before they get up and they can pack away and move to a new site after we identify them? That sort of kill chain based approach that takes focus on the data sharing across all the systems and leaves the legacy systems in place. We can't afford as a country or as the DOD to modernize all of our legacy systems to work in some sort of perfect utopian future world of interoperability. So we have to make do with what we have today and then stitch them together more intelligently. The great thing is we've learned a lot of that from the commercial world. How do you wrap things with microservices? How do you leverage cloud computing and automation? How do you take cloud computing to the edge constructs same advantage of the cloud, but put at the edge, like they're starting to do a 5G Metro Edge compute. Leverage those constructs in the DoD world so we can make the decisions faster and we can make the interoperability while still leveraging your existing legacy systems. I love that phrase though, perfect utopian <laughs> world of interoperability. One of the end goals, as you mentioned, but also is a technology is artificial intelligence. Patrick mentioned it, the colonels mentioned it. Where does that plug in here? I, it's absolutely critical in the future. I think we're still not there from a maturity in a lot of areas. We're using a lot in, I'll say, intelligence development. Um, but we want to get to the future. We can't use it in the military world until we really have trusted AI right, and trusted machine learning. So how do you build that trust up in that over time is absolutely critical. So how do I trust the answers coming out of it? How do I trust how it was developed and it's gonna give me the right answers? And what level, when we talk about a commander in the loop decision, what level of trust are we gonna build that? So it's a cyber trust, it's a trust in supply chain, and it's a trust of there's ways to attack that from a data poisoning that can make your answers give you a different answer. So how do we build that up so we can identify if someone's trying to poison our data that's coming in to drive a different behavior in our AI, our machine learning algorithms that we've deployed? Um, so those are important pieces. And that's a big part we've focused on in Lidos is developing capabilities around protecting the trust of your algorithms and how do you know what your trust is and how do you maintain that in operations over time? Because we can't just take an algorithm developed you know, in 
and commercial world for doing um, you know, geospatial object identification, right? Identifying is that a cat or is that a dog, is that a tree, is that a tank? And then just throw that out there and say, we trust it. How do we maintain it? How do we upgrade it? And how do we know it's giving us the right answers? That's the hard part about bringing that into the DOD. Sometimes as I navigate conversations like this about information technology, I feel like everything is interconnected in a way. And you mentioned the word trust. Is there a zero trust applicability to this conversation or am I conflating two things that really don't belong together? Oh, you're absolutely right. Zero trust is critical. We talked about network resilience. Part of that is zero trust. Um, same thing from a data perspective and a software perspective. We have to apply these principles because we know, we've seen it with solar winds, right? You see attacks into the supply chain. So do I trust the software I got from somebody else? Well, it turns out there's a back door in it. So how do we go and attack that perspective? And that comes from a zero trust. You need to understand where you have enclaves of data and then what is the, the efficacy of that data and how much do I trust it and send it across? Same thing from a network perspective. And it gets really hard in the DoD when we start fighting in multi-layer security. You got everything from the internet to Nipper to secret to top secret to special access enclaves. And I need data to traverse that in a trusted way to get to the warfighter. And how do I do that? Where today, a lot of the policies make that difficult and hard with a lot of manual decisions because we're worried about classified data getting out where it shouldn't. But when I think about war fighting at speed, I gotta be able to create that trust. So the zero trust elements are really, really important, but it gets harder when you talk about fighting in multi-layer security in multi-geographic regions, then I have to have zero trust from the network to the software to the data layer. So those are the key elements, I think, when you think about zero trust and how do you implement it and operationalize it. Now, is the industry there yet? No, zero trust is more of an architecture construct, but now we need to go and realize that in implementation um, and it's pretty hard in the DoD world because you got to do it again inside that legacy environment with legacy networks and legacy software. Well, Doug Jones with Lados, thanks for being here, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll be back with a full season of Defense One TV in 2022. I'm George Jackson. Thanks for watching. Defense One TV, JADC2, and the Future Warfighter. Brought to you by Lidos.